five after Do You Believe in Magic was the hit record. We were just about to release our second single, uh, You Didn't Have to Be So Nice. And our manager called up the band and said, I've got a uh, meeting I'd like you guys to come attend. And we joined up at this office and these two producers came in and said, we have this idea for a TV show where it's going to be modeled after the Beatles and we need four guys, you know, the tall, shy guy, the good looking guy, the funny guy, and the serious guy. And uh, we think the, this band would be a great uh, band for that uh, opportunity. I was the tall, shy guy. And do you mind when I'm talking? I might have been the good looking one. He was the tall, shy, good looking one. Yeah, but we have uh, questions from the audience. Can we ask Wait a minute. Not from friends. You can ask them later. Continue with the monkey story. So anyway, the, the, it all sounded pretty good, you know. It was going to be a network television show. And if it were a success, there's no doubt it would have been a tremendous success for the band too. But then the... Uh, the cap on the whole story was the producer said we also want you to change your name to the monkeys and we had had a hit record as the love and spoonful we had a hit song in the can getting ready to be released called you didn't have to be so nice that we were pretty sure it was going to be a hit too if we took a gamble supposing the tv show wasn't a success and we had changed our name to the monkeys well we already had success as the love and spoonful it didn't take us five minutes to make up our mind and say, uh, no, thank you very much, but we're going to stay the Love and Spoonful. In the band, when you would take votes like this, were, was it one man, one vote, or did Sebastian hold a bigger vote? No, there was one man, one vote. Uh, the record company had a different deal in 1967. It was one of the reasons that uh, the band eventually broke up. Uh, John became what was known as the key man uh, in the subsequent recording contract there was an addition to the original one they named him a key man but in band issues he was only just one one man one vote how long the question was what it was what was it what was it like working with Dylan and first of all explain what you did with Dylan before you say oh, this, what? Is, this is a great story you know I, I had met John Sebastian in the village and I knew he grew up there and you know, people always talk and they tell you things that they know and people they know and blah, blah, blah. And anyway, when we were first rehearsing the band, we were out on Eastern Long Island and we were rehearsing with John, me, and Zali and a drummer that was filling in before Joe Butler joined the band. And on about the fifth night of the rehearsals, the phone rang and uh, I picked it up and uh, answered it and uh, said, uh, hello, and he said, yeah, is John Sebastian there? And I said, yes, he is. Can I say he was calling? He said, oh, it's Bob Dylan. I said, okay. Uh, John, Bob Dylan like to speak to you. And it turns out John was friends with Bob. Of course, I was in total awe of Bob Dylan at the time. I had really made the transition from rock and roll to what Dylan was doing almost in total. And uh, Bob called John. They asked him to come into the city and play bass on, on recordings for the Bring It All Back Home album. And uh, I was the only guy with a car, so to get into the city, he needed me to drive him in there, and we took my base and headed into New York, my Austin Healy, and got to Columbia Studio B. And again, like meeting the Beatles, this was before we were famous. We were just a band rehearsing some original songs. Uh, Bob Dylan couldn't have been more gracious and more regular guy, and uh, he asked John to play on these four songs, and. John tried for about an hour and finally said, here, why don't you let a real bass player try? And so Bob asked me if I'd like to play on it, and I said, absolutely, you know, what, what floor do you want me to jump off? I think is how I put it in the book. And uh, it was really, it was an amazing experience, but it was as regular as it gets. He just told me the key the songs were in, played it a couple of times, and said, whatever comes into your mind, play it. At the time, Bob was using, he was getting ready to go electric. He hadn't taken on the full uh, Newport Folk Festival changeover yet, but he was getting ready to go electric. And so I played on four of the songs, 
I think Maggie's farm is the only one that I'm really sure was my base plan, but I, you can't really tell, and over the years, uh, in the great uh, world of internet know-it-alls, people will tell you that this person played on that record and that person played on this record. Um, but I'm quite certain that my bass playing is on the uh, Maggie's Farm and, and a couple, possibly 4th Street. And there's no way really to know, but I know working with Bob Dylan was a, a real high point for me. And, and after that, we spent the rest of the evening driving around uh, Manhattan in his Plymouth station wagon, smoking joint after joint and talking about motorcycles. So, <laughs> it's a great night. <laughs> So was the book something you always knew you would do uh, as you got to a certain age or was it a response to, was it the project you went after because the band didn't get together and you really wanted to document what you had lived through? Actually, uh, I'd always wanted to write a book and I only could get as far as a song. I'm not, I don't think I have the skills to write a complete book. But in 19, or in 2009, uh, this fellow called me up, identified himself as Tony Moss, and said he wanted to write a story on my Blue Sea studio in Baltimore. And he went on to explain that he was from Baltimore and worked for CBS Sports now. And I had a really good conversation with him. He was a real regular guy, made sense, talked well, knew what he was talking about. So we did a great interview, and the article came out in the summer of 09, and uh, it was a fantastic article. It's in Baltimore Magazine. It's the best article ever done on the studio that was And the done. photos were beautiful, too. Yeah, yeah. Very, really a, a tremendously good piece. After the story came out, I went up to him and said, Tony, is there any chance you'd be interested in co-writing a book with me? And he said, well, you know, I've got a real important job, and... Uh, at the time, I had just moved back to Florida. He said, I live in Philadelphia now. I just don't think we could make it work. He said, but let me think about it for a while. And uh, a month later, he called me up and says, you're not gonna believe this, but my job just got upgraded and I've been transferred to Florida. And also, I'm so much closer to you now, I'd love to take on the project of writing the book. And once that was done, that was in early 2010, um, we knew then there was going to be a, a book deal, and so uh, I wouldn't have done it without Tony. He's a not only a tremendous writer, but a tremendously warm enthusiast for music. Not just music from the 60s, but all music. And he's a sports writer as an occupation, but his, his skills as a writer in the entertainment field is just as good as it gets. So I'm very proud and glad that he worked with me on that. Did, did you talk most of it and then he wove it into a narrative? Actually, what I would do is I would write a chapter and then he would throw it all out <laughs> and, and uh, rewrite the chapter. And uh, in some cases, I would go down to his house and spend a weekend just talking into a microphone for 20, 30 hours at a time. And that would be the pieces that he needed to fill in the parts that weren't there. Dedication. You know, in the entertainment business, uh, one of the things I like to say is that the day you quit is the day before you're going to make it. And if you really believe you've got talent and you want to make it in the entertainment business, don't quit. Because it will definitely be the day before you would have made it. And uh, I've seen that happen time after time with people I knew were very dedicated and, uh, and didn't stick it out, you know, unfortunately. Did you read Keith Richards' memoir? No, I did not. Have, did you model yours on any, did you read any rock memoirs that you felt might show you the way to go? Uh, Neil Peart, uh, the drummer for uh, Rush. Of all the people you could have mentioned, I can't believe you said Neil Peart. Well, it wasn't his memoir. It was, he lost his wife and his daughter in one year's time and he got on his motorcycle and just rode around to try and get it out of his mind. He wrote this book called Ghost Rider. And my wife bought it for me. And it was such a tremendously personal book and, and a lot of musical emotions came out in it. And it impressed me so much that it really gave me the impetus to actually start the project and do it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 
you know, you had a, sing a singular experience uh, from a very important time in American history. Did, did part of you feel that writing this book was an obligation to what you had witnessed? Well, one thing I feel very strongly about is that over the years, the real love and spoonful story has never been told. Uh, there's been a lot of attempts at the story. Uh, the Love and Spoonful was like a, uh, 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 a shooting star. Uh, for one year, for one year we blazed across the sky, had seven top ten hit records in a row, and then we were gone. You know, we were around for two and a half years, but really from May of 1965 to May of 1966, it was the only period that the Love and Spoonful was a fully functioning band. And then we just disappeared. And over the years, people have heard the songs, they've heard all of our songs. I can't tell you how many comments I hear at shows we do now where people say, you know, I knew this song, but I didn't know you guys did it. And uh, I think I can say that about all of our songs except for Do You Believe in Magic and Summer in the City. Uh, Nashville Cats, uh, What a Day for a Daydream, uh, Did You Ever Have to Make Up Your Mind? Those are all songs people know. But if you ask somebody who did that song, nine times out of ten, you're not going to get a right answer. So I really felt that if nobody else was going to do it and everybody else had a chance to, I wanted to tell the Love and Spoonful story and why it was only a one-year career and why it could have been longer and what caused it from being longer. And uh, also some, uh, some flags for young musicians to, to be aware of that, that it's not... You know, it's not all fun and games. It's a very serious business, and you have to take it seriously. So that was the reason for the book, really, was just to tell the Love and Spoonful story in full. Have any of the other members gotten back to you and said, Steve, why did you air our dirty laundry? No, uh, no. Actually, John Sebastian said that he thought it was going to cost him work because I mentioned the fact that his voice wasn't as good as it was when he was originally singing. And I said, John, I'm not the first person that said that. And, uh, and not only that, later in the book I go on to say his voice is getting a lot better because I just did a show with him last December down in Florida. And it was, uh, it was one of the best shows we've ever done together. Um, I hope someday to release it. We videoed it. And it was just a really uh, very charming get-together of two guys on a bass guitar and a guitar and, and played about an hour and a half worth of music and he sang great. But his only comment really was just that he thought that my mention was going to cost him work. And uh, I don't think he's losing any sleep over it, to tell you the truth. It seems a little small-minded response. Yeah, I, I mean, think it's a pretty a narrow of, response. I think there's a lot of things in the book he could have taken objection to that would have been more suitable for an objection, but he chose not to. And, uh, you know, I think that Joe Butler, uh, who... He's like a brother to me. We fight like dogs, but we love each other. I thought he was going to find a lot of areas to be objectionable to, but he thinks it's one of the two or three best books he's ever read about a rock memoir. Um, of course, Zali's not here, and uh, Jerry Esther, my father-in-law, has not commented. 